Everyone has emotions. <laughs> In case you didn't notice, we are emotional type of being. God created us with emotions. He didn't like take Adam and then say, okay, I'm going to take a rib out and make Eve and suddenly all the emotions went to the woman and the man doesn't have any. No, that's not the way it works. <laughs> your physical body, your physiology, your soul has emotions. As a matter of fact, we're told in some ways the soul is the seat of our emotional being. That might be true. The scriptures doesn't say it that way, but it does say that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And I know for many men, women say they don't have emotions, but the men do. And men have emotions. They're just a trained response. It's a behavioral type of trained attitude or action with which they deal with their emotions. I personally, because I was raised with emotions and I was raised in a matriarchal family and probably more in touch with my emotive side than my denial side. <laughs> but then also because of God knowing ahead of time that I would be involved with my, my physiology because of my disability or my, uh, I should say, my Crohn's disease because what was disabled in the world is enabled in Jesus so it's kind of like hard to put the place of where I am. Am I disabled or not disabled? Am I capable or incapable? It's like, am I disabled or not disabled? Half the time, I don't even think most of the people that see me know, <laughs> much less me, because there are times when God gives me the strength that, man, I can do things that normal people can't do. It blows their minds as well as mine. Then there are other times where, yeah, you know, not so strong. But, you know, I still blow people's minds, even as old as I am, especially if I go dancing. But the point being is that one of the consequences of my physiology is that my emotional balance is often goes through the gamut of all the emotions that you could possibly imagine in one day. <laughs> Go through it. And it's not because it's like a roller coaster ride of up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Like you would say, you know, some emotional type of Christian that just goes, you know, and is led by those things. No. You see, I have peace. I have fruits of the Spirit. I have peace. I have love. I have joy. I have meanness, kindness, kindness, gentleness. And of those things I can draw from, should I choose to exercise my faith therein, as well as my focus, which my mind helps me to do, when I choose to observe that part of my life that is led by the Spirit of God, as opposed to the emotions of my soul. Because you can be led by your emotions, and you can be led by your devotions. You can be led by your physiology, you can be led by psychology, you can be led by lots of things, sociology, even psychiatry. <laughs> Although that's a little weird, you kind of program that one in. But that's why you have to do it too, literally program it in in order to be led by it. But the point being, what you're led by determines where you're going. I mean, if I want to go, oh, I don't know, long distance, you know, no offense, but you know, I don't go get a race car in order to go long distance. I can't afford the gas. So if I want to go long distance, I get a car that's economical if I'm going to drive a car. But if I'm going to go very long distances, like over the ocean, then I take an airplane. I mean, quite frankly, I want to be led by that airplane because it'll take me over the obstacle of the ocean. And that's kind of what happens in life. You have to determine where you're going, what you're going to be led by, and how you're going to get there pretty simple. If you're an emotional type person, your emotions are going to lead you very good in certain ways. It's good to go to a rock concert and get all excited or a worship service and get all emotional. It's sometimes good to get emotional at maybe a funeral service as well as a worship service. Kind of like, you know, one end of the other, you know, one extreme and you kind of go up and down. But God never intended us to be led by our emotions. He intended us to have emotions that would choose to affect us, to turn us towards devotion, that we would learn to yield ourselves to what the Spirit of God was doing in our lives at that moment. So that the emotion maybe would capture our attention and put us in devotion with God. Meaning that we would be closer to Him because of our emotions 
and not distant from him because the emotions are blocking us from hearing him or seeing him. Because the fruit of the Spirit has an emotional consequence. It's like the fruit of the Spirit is almost like a fruit on a tree. Almost. But you see, the fruit of the Spirit still has to have something done to it in order to become what God wants it to be in our life. And that's by way of it applying itself to you, it has to come from the Spirit of God and be, pardon me, but squished or squashed or just annihilated and made into something more than just a fruit. It has to become something that you can use. And the only way you can use it is by drinking it. And in heaven, literally, when we see John doing something, he ate a scroll. You know, I mean, that was kind of like the Word of God. And that sounds a little weird to me, but you know what? There are things that are going to happen in a spiritual reality that may not make sense in our physical reality. But in our physical reality, it doesn't make much sense to eat something and then have to expiate the leftovers, you know, and that it all rolls in here and kind of moves around and comes around and kind of goes inside out and goes twisted and, you know, kind of squishes and squashes and gets everything out of it it can and then gets rid of it out of our physiology, you know, kind of like, you know what I'm saying, pooper scoopers. <laughs> That don't make no sense, at least not in a spiritual realm, because God doesn't waste anything. Where it seems like we do. Matter of fact, it seems like that's all we do is waste a lot of things. But that's the way we're built physically. Now, emotionally, we don't waste emotions as much as we think we do, because those emotions are meant to do something, but they take something from us. Those emotions that aren't from the Spirit of God will take rather than give. And the interesting thing is that the emotions from the Spirit of God, from the fruit of the Spirit, give, but they do not take. In other words, peace doesn't take from you, peace gives. Love doesn't take from you, the love of God, the love that God's talking about, doesn't take from you, it gives. The meekness doesn't take from you, it gives. Everything that is from the Spirit of God gives, and abundantly gives, and is that type of emotional reaction or action that you should be employing whenever you feel the emotional pulling, tugging, tearing, you know, kind of like ripping you off or leading you in the wrong direction. When your emotions are leading you, you know, unless you really want to go down that road, you know, being led by your emotions, you know, you should be turning that emotive part of you back to the emotions that come from the fruit of the Spirit, that come from the Spirit of God causing you to know peace, love, joy. Meekness, temperance, kindness, gentleness, all of those things that you see listed as far as being part of love or being part of the fruit of the Spirit, those things really are the experiences of knowing God. And as you know Him more, and I mean experience, and as you put into application the Word of God in experience, which is what we call wisdom, by the way. It's like taking the knowledge and applying life's experiences together and working together cooperatively. They become the wisdom that Proverbs talks about and that you know we talk about in Ecclesiastes and that God is always saying that you know seek after her or seek after it. Life's experiences. And that's what happens is that it's not just an experiential type of God or word. It's not just a word of God or God to the Word, but it's together cooperatively working in your life as you experience life in the Word of God, using it with life according to the experiences that you're going through by way of the Holy Spirit, making it applicable to your life so that you would become the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God personified in the person you are, not being led by your emotions. So it's interesting, this thing about emotions, because in our soul, there's two opposite ways that we could go. You know, in our flesh, there's only one way. I mean, yeah, the flesh only knows one way to go. I'm sorry. You may think that all this out external input is causing some internal change, but really, no, the Holy Spirit's interpreting it for you. Sorry. Yeah, same thing the way he does with prayer, he does for your soul. So your soul is kind of being torn back and forth, you know, to and fro sometimes, you know, with every room of doctrine, unless you control it by way of your spirit. Because, you see, your spirit, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, can cause you to focus your attention and your emotions in one direction. You can quit being so fleshy. You can quit being so emotional. You could be spiritual. You know, walking in the spirit. 
led by the Spirit of God. For me, every day, I have to do that. You know, I go through kind of my ups and downs and stuff because my physiology is trying to war against my flesh and my flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and all these other things that are going on also trying to influence me from the outside, you know, spirit to wickedness, five places, you know, principalities and powers and all that junk. And then also, you know, kind of like the fleshy inputs, you know, all those things that, you know, physiologically can affect you, you know, like too much sugar, too little sugar, too much salt, too little salt, not enough fluid, too much fluid. Huh. Whoa, bloated, ha, huh. wow, <laughs> Ugh, I feel terrible. But we don't have to yield ourselves to those things because we're told to yield our members our parts of our body unto Christ unto Jesus yielding your part of you yielding your flesh unto Jesus yielding your soul unto Jesus yielding your emotions unto God letting God put in order in proper place those feelings you have those emotions you're going through those times of even doubt or fear or things that aren't part of your normal routine, you know, when you're walking and talking with God. That's what God can do when you choose to let Him and you yield your members, your bar, parts of your body. That's what it means in the King James, members, parts of your body. Yield your parts of your body, your soul, your spirit, your flesh to God. And as you yield that unto Him, asking Him to take over, then he puts your emotions back in a proper place so that when you have an emotion, you're not emotional, but you're aware of those emotions and you feel them to the point of bringing you to a bridge that you can cross over to someone else that's having that same emotion and giving to them the same comfort with which you were comforted by way of the Holy Spirit or a word by way of the Holy Spirit or a experience that you've gone through by way of the Holy Spirit causing you to remember those things that Jesus has taught you. You know, in your life, through your experiences of life, that you can reach over across that emotional bridge to touch someone else's life. Because in an emotive way, in an emotional way, that is one of the best ways to communicate with our emotions. It's one of the things that we do beyond our words, beyond our statements, beyond the things that are, our heart is full of as it comes out of our mouth. But that's why God doesn't say, don't be emotional. But don't be led by the emotions, because you want to get someplace with your emotions. And the way to get to the place of the Spirit is to be led by the Spirit of God. And those types of emotion that come from the fruit of the Spirit and not the fruit of the flesh. So, in today's devotion, which is always interesting because, you know, it's like, where, God, are you going to go with this? And I'm like, I don't know, Lord. You know, we're just kind of like, you know, out there babbling. You know, God, you're just going to talk about it. You know, it's like, well, okay, God, you know, what's it going to say? Do I look at your devotions ahead of time? Nope. <laughs> I never do. <laughs> so, who knows what the Word of God might say? But, whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. Amen to that one. Praise your Lord. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Not just singing, not just, you know, kind of like, you know, putting on the iPod or downloading the tune, you know, but singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's, and in your emotive part, your soul. <laughs> you are a royal priesthood, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you, out of darkness into his marvelous light. You, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, yeah, a royal, ro yes, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. By him, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Often, when you are down in an emotion, giving praise brings you upward with that emotion. Often, when you are depressed about something that's going on in your experiences of life, 
giving thanks will turn that experience into a learning opportunity so that you realize there's more to life than just being the recipient of what you think life is doing to you. As a matter of fact, once you begin to think, consider, ponder, look at it from God's perspective, from a greater viewpoint or vantage point than your own, you realize there's more to whatever it is you're going through in life than what you thought at the time because you could only see a limited amount. But the more that you're able to see it from his point of view, in perspective of bringing you out of yourself into his throne room and looking down on yourself, that's a way that God takes us with praise, with worship, with prayer, with communication, with talking to him, with walking with him, with being led by his spirit. Because always, all of those things that are mentioned, including the word of God, including Jesus himself, will lift us up rather than put us down. God never has brought people down in order to know him. But he said that if you would humble yourself, I would lift you up. I will bring you out of yourself so that you can see me first and then see you as I see you, as I chose to make you into what I want you to be, as I have determined for myself that I will complete the work that I will do in you unto the day that you are one day standing face to face with me and that we can have communion, you and I. And that's your father. That's what a father does. At least, that's what a father in heaven does. <laughs>